Welcome to episode three of the Performance Advantage podcast with myself, Dr. Will O'Connor, and yourself, Dr. Matt Miller, aka MTB PhD. Today we're talking about one of Matt's favorite topics, propulsive cycling power. Yeah, yeah. And we say propulsive because, Matt, you have a little project in the works uh, for braking power. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's been in the works for a long time, and luckily um, I'll be able to talk more about it yeah, probably next week, which is pretty sweet. Yeah, We'll save it, you know, we'll kind of trickle yeah. the information in as we go. But we need to make the differentiation now, because we can measure braking power, that, you know, we're talking about cycling propulsive power. Yeah, Which so that's your standard that's power you people are going to understand when when you yeah. say, you know, riding with power. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cool. Uh, all right then, Matt, why don't you sort of give me a bit of a rundown on what power is for cycling? Yeah, so for me, um, power is like the holy grail of um, information for training your fitness for cycling. Yeah. Like kind of if if you're not measuring power, you're actually you end up making a lot of guesses as to what's kind of going on. Yeah. And the for reason sure. power's the reason power's so good is because um, you know we can start with a definition and we can say you know power is the rate of doing work. Yeah. So when we're thinking about riding a bike, if we can push harder on the pedals more times. That's that's going to be more work. If we can do that more quickly, we're just going to go faster. Yeah. So it's really, really simple. So the higher your power is, um, the more work you're doing Yeah. Um, okay. in that one second. So it's joules per second. So, joules. so that's um, work. We understand joules from eating food. Kilojoules, yeah. kilocalories, something like that. Yeah. Yep. So how much work we're doing uh, over time. Yeah, that's right. So, you know... Um, we're measuring it. We're not measuring. Um, we're doing a little bit different when we're measuring because we're usually measuring it in the crank yep. power, right? Okay. So we're measuring. Um, we're, we end up measuring the torque, right? So the torque. The, there's little tiny strain gauges somewhere in the crank. It almost doesn't matter where they are. They're made to measure the torque that you're producing, and then measures how quickly that's turning around. So right? just so, that, uh, so torque is the force applied at the end of a lever. Yeah, so it's a force at a distance. Yep. So if we know the distance and we know what the strain is on the strain gauges, um, we can calculate a torque. So it's super simple. Yeah, so like, the, um, the distance being the, the length of the crank. Right, that's right. The force is what you are pushing down. Yeah, sure. We don't want to get into defining force, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, but... I'm just, um, I'm just trying to, you know, just so people can sort of work it through in their head. They push yeah, down right. on the pedal, it's it's measured along the crank, um, and then that is the, the work, right? That's your torque. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then what we do is we multiply the torque by how quickly you're spinning. And you can just think of just your RPM, so your yeah, cadence. Yeah, so cadence. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, if, you know, once we do some calculations based on the crank length, if we know your RPMs and we know how, how hard you're pushing, we know what your power is at any time. Okay. So that's, that's pretty good, right? Yeah. That is good. Yeah. I mean, it's great because that's what we want. That's what we're, we want to uh, know. We want to know what the muscles are doing, right? Because we measure heart rate. Yes, and heart definitely. rate's been around for years and years and years. Yeah. And, you know, that's the cardiovascular response to doing work. Yeah. Right? So we're measuring the response when we're to our, our power when we're measuring heart rate. So actually, when you combine those two measurements, it's really, really good. Yeah. And more like different to, to running or swimming which are kind of more controlled uh because if we just looked at heart rate and say speed we have no idea right headwind tailwind uphill downhill it, it doesn't really besides like your general sort of um i guess aerobic training um you still don't know if you're getting better yeah. like with running well we have pace right and and yeah sure you've got a hill and stuff but no one's expecting to be running faster up a hill than they are on the flat um so then power essentially gives us that what like an objective measure or or of of our outputs yeah right like you can compare your power today to yep. your power 10 years ago yeah 
right? And you know, you'll know, you know, if you kind of know what your weight is, um, you know how you compare to yourself 10 years ago. So if you do, you know, like the 10 year challenge, maybe your power was way higher <laughs> yeah. and you're way lighter. So you were probably way faster. Yeah. And maybe today your power is way lower and you weigh a little bit more. Um, so you're, you know, you're much slower. Um, oh yeah. I guess, um, if we really got into it, we could get, uh, get a bit, uh, not really like versus like comparisons, aerodynamics, uh, the type, yeah. the type of power meter, Matt, are they all yeah. going to be comparable? Um, that's yeah. probably the other thing. I mean, there's one of the most common questions for me is like, oh, I'm going to get a power meter. What, what one should I get? You know, yeah, there's, well, there's left only, there's jewel, yeah. there's, there's pedals, um, there's the spindles. Uh, what else? There's the hub. I don't know if they're really doing those anymore. Um, no, I don't know. There's the, like, four eye. They, they just, they take your crank and put one on for you. Yeah, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So what what one should I get? I mean, you, I know I'm asking you this because I know you did that study where you measured a whole bunch of them. Yeah, yeah. So I think you actually mentioned something really you know interesting where you talked about kind of aerodynamics. If I'm comparing my power to my power, it doesn't matter what the wind was on that day, really. Yeah. If we think about it, so yeah, that's no, that's you're really right, good. You're right. And that you know I think that's an important point when people talk about well I know what my pace was. Well, you don't actually like your pace almost. Um, is kind of dependent on what the wind was. You know, if you had a tailwind yeah. or whatever, and you're doing a test, uh, which we'll talk about that in a little bit, like testing your power. Um, you know, if you're going by pace, you know, you're kind of missing out a lot. But yeah, so we did like so um, when the, there was this. There's this brand called Stages, and um, when they first came out, I this was maybe about five or six years ago. You know, they measure power in only the left side. Crank. Yeah, I mean, when they came out, everyone is sort of, because of their low price point compared to what was um, already on the market, which is your, generally your dual-based full crank kind of setups, SRM, Quark, um, so you're looking 2,000 plus. And then and then Stages came out with the, I don't know, it was around 1,000 bucks. Yeah, so they pretty much have the price. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they did do it a, a little bit differently. So SRM, which is the original you know, consider the gold standard, um, they're, you know, pretty accurate, yep. really expensive. They're yep. measuring power within the chain ring. So it's within, the strain gauges are built within this chain ring spider. Okay. So what you're getting is you're yep. getting the tension on the chain. Okay. Is where so you're that, getting the Is torque. that even like kind of better um, than measuring it in the crank? Because now you're looking at more of like what, that's like transferred power. Right, because you can you can push down on the pedals really hard, but if it if your bike's really flexy, um, like the the power will be going through the crank, but will it be going into the chain and into the rear wheel? Yeah, sure. There's probably some of that being lost, um, for sure. But you know, if they're measuring uh, within the strain gauge, we're going to lose those same kind of energies when we're whether we're pushing, uh, whether whether we're measuring on the left or not, right? Okay. Because we're yep. still pushing on the left. Yeah. 50% of the yeah, time, yeah. right? Yeah, right, okay. Cool. Um, so, so that's probably not a huge worry, but, um, you know, like, um, it makes sense, right? Like, I measured in the chain ring, the power I'm putting, like, you can just look at it and be like, okay, yeah, that power meter is what I want because it's right. So, yeah. you know, they've been around for a while. There's a couple of different brands. Um, and then, you know, this left arm thing came out, and we're like, hmm, I don't know about that. Like yeah. we're scientists yeah you know? yeah let's yeah, get like, some how does in. that work is over on the other like non-drive side yeah of the of the bike yeah and you know because we push with both legs so if we're measuring yeah, we with only the left we're not actually measuring what's happening uh at with the right at all right so if we have it within the the chain ring spider we're measuring with both yeah um with both legs but you know left side only is only measuring the left leg and it's, you know, pretty easy to kind of calculate um, power in that way. Um, the calculations are on their website, and you can look at it, and it, it makes sense. So they're just kind of estimating and, you know, assuming that, you know, both legs are pretty much the same. Yeah. Which they pretty much are for everyone. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, within a couple percent, like if you're off by like 2 or 3% in one leg versus the other, that's not much, and that's pretty standard amongst like pro cyclists. Yeah, um, right. So that's not a worry, right? So we got them in. 
We're like, okay, let's do a bunch of experiments using three power meters on one bike at the same time. Yep, I remember riding uh, my bike on the treadmill. <laughs> yeah, actually, it wasn't even your bike. No, it, was it like wasn't. A... It was like, I don't know how many sizes too small. There's a yeah. photo. I'll try to find that photo and put it up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The fo- In the photo, like, we're in the lab, and, uh, you know, we did, part of the test was a treadmill study. Um, yeah, so Will was on the treadmill. Very controlled. Yeah, yeah. Like, we controlled the speed. Um, and then we had everyone ride on it. But, um, you know, Will's wearing a cycling kit. And I'm wearing, like, some sweatpants. I don't know how, yeah. you know, I had sweatpants in the lab, but you can find that photo. <laughs> um, please don't. Maybe we should delete it before people start looking for them. It's like sweatpants and a button-up shirt. It just yeah, doesn't that was go. what you used to, as, you know, you stopped caring about yourself. You're a scientist. Yeah, the, yeah that's, actually, that's actually not true. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, that was the one part that we did. So we had this lab lab test and what we did is we hooked up one bike with a stages power meter yeah right so that's left side only and then on the drive side we had a quark power meter yeah um which is measuring in the strain gate or in the chain ring spider and then we had a power tap power meter on the rear wheel so we measured power three different places yes all right Um, and and you know drum roll um there's pretty much no difference really yeah like they're all pretty much the same so like statistically we found some differences um in you know how quickly they return to zero Um, okay yeah which is pretty important if you're like pedaling and then coasting pedaling like mountain biking especially and that's you know how we tested it um like on some trails and we just noticed that you know the the more recent technology, which was using an accelerometer to measure power, um, that went to zero more quickly. So this is what, because I I had bought a stages, um, and what I noticed and other people noticed was stages was reading slightly lower um, than other power meters. And from my understanding was because of the accelerometer, it wasn't measuring cadence um, once a revolution when it went past the, the cadence magnet, it was measuring it continuously so that when there was no power or a slowing of the cadence, it essentially, you know, lowered the power output. Whereas on the other ones, which are measuring cadence once every revolution, it sort of estimated that the power was on almost the whole time. Right. Yeah. Cause it didn't know kind of what was happening between where the measurements were happening. Right. So if you were measuring it six times per revolution versus continuously throughout a revolution um you're going to get higher resolution right by measuring yep. more times so um you know that's kind of what we figured was happening um is that you know that's why the power was a little bit lower because we were getting more zeros um maybe more ref- reflective of what was actually happening yes um, uh, but so, really so then comparing to... is it like you've got a quark or maybe my bikes you know got a mountain bike or a time trial bike and a road bike, cyclocross bike, gravel bike, downhill bike. Um, I got an e-bike. No, I don't, but BMX, you know, some people do. Some people do. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And I've got different power meters on all these bikes. How do I, can I go, oh, that's lower and that's higher or, or like, is there any way to do that? Or you can only really compare within the same. Yeah. So, you know, if you're watching your own fitness um, and you're trying to like test yourself, right, you need to be um, comparing the same power meter every time you're doing testing. Yeah. So if we go back to your study, what did did you find the differences between? No. So we we would call that, you know, in science or whatever, we'd call that reliability. So we want to know if we use the same piece of equipment today and we use it 10 years from now or whatever it is yeah we want to make sure that it's producing the measurement you know with no error yeah because yeah. if we're comparing our fitness we need to be comparing apples to apples right yes. we don't want to be comparing apples to oranges no right so definitely. reliability is really important um so um you know companies will report their own reliability and we actually didn't you know test reliability because we need to do it over and over and over um, across many days, different temperatures and things like yeah. that. Um, 
but you know they're pretty reliable there's been new studies that come out and people love doing research on new power meters because everyone you know believes that they're wrong like these new pieces of equipment there's no way that can be right yeah um but i think you know sometimes like scientists are a little bit out of touch which actually which with what's actually happening um in the engineering world so yeah. when engineers are making something that's measuring torque like it's measuring torque yeah. right that's that's their product is made to measure torque so they you know go to great lengths to make sure that it's measuring it accurately yeah um, and it's not that complicated no no it's not yeah and you know so there's then because as a like as a sports scientist i guess we look at it we don't look at the um like the mechanical object we're like how could you like directly reflect a human's like energetic output in such an accurate way there's no way but in actual fact like it's just how, how much how hard are you pressing on a lever yeah, yeah. Like we've it's... measured that for pro you know over a century um just applying it to a bicycle is like super easy and you yeah. see that now i mean how many you're involved in the industry now like how many power meters are there um there's probably about 20 different brands yeah you know there's and more than that, they, surely yeah oh i guess because there's, there's the companies that make all the subsidiaries yeah yeah sure yeah. like there's you know brands that are made by different companies and um you know some companies might make for a couple of different brands and um yeah there's a lot going on and you know engineers like it's their job to make something that works and they do a lot of like that's why it costs so much like yep. they need to make sure it works and there's a lot of d development that goes goes on in the background um so you know if you're buying something from like a pretty reputable brand um just use the same one all the time compare apples to apples and um, you're going to be pretty good yeah know? so just just buy one even if it's the cheapest one you can you'll yeah. still be fine yeah 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 totally just don't get that one that measures like the wind um there's like a little wind fairing on the <laughs> yeah, front and there's also yeah. like one that goes on the on the valve stem yeah there's also one that goes on your shoe okay yeah. uh yeah within the sole nah right? not in the sole just okay. on the like almost like the running one that goes through your laces yeah so they're estimating power based on acceleration yeah. and um and your weight and height and yeah and, and like the weight of the bike i'm guessing it's probably similar to site um to the running one and like it grabs a bunch of data from your gps so like altitude and um gradient and all that kind of kind of jargon um, yeah well because it so what it's doing is it's continuously estimating like it's continuously measuring acceleration super yep. easy super cheap kind of sensor put in your shoe put it wherever yeah um, and then if you know the speed um you can kind of estimate like someone's rolling resistance and their aerodynamic drag and then you know you take that all away and oh well you have um power yeah but it's, it's not that good especially for like um variable like surfaces so it's like something like mountain biking if you're using speed as your estimate of aerodynamic drag um and that you know if you're riding on a really hard packed surface and then suddenly you hit a puddle yeah. your speed's going to reduce there's suddenly way more drag like your power readings just it's... yeah so let's just for for mountain biking the like a good contrast that people would be able to understand it's like the road um whatever tar seal bitumen straight um hot mix and then long wet grass right like it's a struggle to go through long wet grass yeah um, and if you were just looking at oh yeah i went 20 k's an hour and now i'm going 10 k's an hour but i'm blowing through the ringer like look at your power yeah yeah right so like if you were to produce the same exact power on that grass and then the same exact power on a different like sealed surface you're just going to go faster on the sealed surface because there's less drag yeah um all right, so we've we're now confident that we can buy whatever power meter we want. Um, what do we do with it once we've got it? Yeah, so um, you know you're gonna so you're gonna get your power meter. 
you're going to record it on your your, de your device on the front of your bike, whatever kind of brand it is. Yeah. You're going to upload it to whatever software because they all kind of do the same thing. And you're going to look at a bunch of graphs. And you're going to be like, what the heck am I looking at? Yeah. What does it you mean? Know? Yeah. So, you know, I kind of look at power meters as, as being beneficial in two ways. And the first way is um, to monitor your intensity during training. Okay. Right. So, you know, that's what we're doing when we're training is we're kind of manipulating how hard we go how, and the duration of that um, to get some sort of response within our muscles that makes us go be go faster. Yeah. So right. we're, we're like when we're trying to train ourselves or athletes, we're looking at the, the demands of the event that they're training for and then the biological, physiological sort of uh, areas that need to be trained. Yeah. And, and then yeah. without um, trying to do that without guessing. Yeah. Yeah, which, you know, since we've, you know, been part of different events and we've looked at lots of different kind of power files, we, we can look at an event and we pretty much... Um, you know, as coaches, we kind of know what the athlete needs yeah. to get that kind of response, response right? So, yeah. the, you know, we'd say prescribe some intervals and, um, you know, it's exercise at this power for this long. You know, we kind of know what kind of response that's going to give us when it comes to the event. Yeah. Um, and looking at your power while you're riding is the way to monitor your intensity. Okay, so we've got we've we've uploaded our first ride and we're just looking at it like I don't I don't know what is it what does it mean where where should we like and then you're talking about doing intervals like how what's my starting point like where am I gonna know I know uh, a lot of people are talking FTP functional threshold power um, not you're not the biggest fan of that uh, but. That's going to be what most people are looking at because uh, they're using some sort of device, um, like software that is going to measure it. Um, so why don't you just uh, run us through, I guess, you've got your power meter, now you need to test, really, your yeah. your abilities and what to look at when you've when you've done your testing. Yeah, okay. So the, um, there's a couple ways to assess your fitness. Yeah. Um, based on power. And one of the most common ways is functional threshold power. So that's functional threshold power estimates um, the power output of your lactate threshold. Sorry, so if we go a, into the lab. It is a estimate. Yeah. Yeah. It is an estimate. It's right. It's not a hard, direct science. It's essentially no. a made up algorithm. Uh, it's pretty good. You know, if you think about your, your lactate threshold, you can't sustain your lactate threshold forever, right? Yeah. So it's a kind of hard intensity that if you exercise at that, you'd probably be pretty cooked at, at an hour and you'd yeah. have to, you know, take a nap or something like that, <laughs> right? So if you go out and no one wants to do a, a time trial for one hour. Um, I do not. No, like <laughs> as hard as you can go for one hour. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, that, that'd be a good way to get our, our lactate threshold, you know, apart from going into the lab. Yeah, and the lab has its other benefits, which we'll definitely have to talk about um, some other time. But you know, I have my power meter. I can go do this eight or twenty minute um, time trial. Okay, right? eight or twenty and, minutes. Sorry. Yeah, eight or twenty minutes. So I, you know, do a standardized warm up that I'm going to do every time because I'm comparing apples to apples. Yeah. And I'll go probably up a hill because um, we don't want to worry about like spinning out our gear or, or anything like that. We'll go up a hill. Okay. Right, and just go produce the highest power we can produce for that that set amount of time okay right. um just a question on that outside versus inside like if we're trying to compare apples with apples should we jump on the trainer and do it yeah i mean you can do it on the trainer the only okay. problem is unless you're doing all your training inside on the trainer like there's some energy losses that are happening um and, you know, you don't get these little tiny micro recoveries inside yep. on the trainer because you're constantly always pedaling. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, if you're training lower. outside. Yeah. So you might as well just do it outside. Yeah. Plus, it's more fun outside, really. Oh, but, you should. Mm, I, I don't know, man. you got some Zwifters out there that are pretty hard converts. Yeah. Well, you know what? If you, if you want to test inside, just test inside all the time. 
Yeah. And if you're using it to gauge where your fitness is, just that's yeah. what you need the to do. The issue becomes control. where, and I've had this um, happen, where you're testing inside but then trying to apply it outside. Like now we're looking at different, now we're looking at apples and, and oranges. Yeah, or, apples or maybe and apples bananas. and pears, like it's the same sort of like um, phylum. Is it? Well, well yeah. I yeah. mean, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Yeah, they must be pretty close. Yeah, Proof. so they're in there. Anyway, Matt, yeah. um, back onto the topic. So, inside, yeah. outside, whatever. We're doing eight or 20 minutes up a hill. We're doing our best possible output. And, and now what? So now you have this average power output. So that's cool. the the work that you did in this many seconds, whatever the minutes are. Yep. It, it'll tell you average power. Yeah. Um, and then you know if you do eight minutes, you multiply that by zero point nine. If zero doing... point nine. Yeah. Okay. So if I did three hundred watts for eight minutes. Yeah. Um, I'd multiply that by zero point nine, and that my um, functional threshold power would be two hundred seventy watts. Cool. And then if you do a 20 minute test, um, since 20 minutes is closer to one hour, you would multiply that by 0 0.95. 0 0.95, 20 minutes, 0 0.95, and eight minutes is 0 0.9. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so then you have your functional threshold power. And what you can do then is you can retest that, you know, over and over and over, but yep. also like it's really good because you can estimate your training zones. Right, which is pretty good. Yeah, so, I mean, now we have a, essentially a, a number, an output of our our lactate threshold. Um, so we can work up or down from that. And the body essentially generally responds the same throughout people, like on average, if you're going to be going far above it or far below it in terms of the durations you can sustain. Yeah, sure. Like if you're going... A little bit above your functional threshold power or quite a lot above you're just not going to be able to do it forever yeah that you know you, you're in the diminishing returns side of things there and then below that you're on the more of a sustained effort yeah 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 so you know i always you know you can go you can take your ftp type in ftp zone calculator in google or whatever and then you know you enter your ftp it spits out three or four or five zones for you yeah Right. Um, and do you do you have a particular zone one that you'd use and the Andy Coggin one? Um, yeah, I've used that. Look that up. Um, if you use Training Peaks, it's it's built within there. Um, I can't comment on what Strava uses, but if you ever look at the Andy Coggin one, you can. Uh, it, there's numerous calculators out there. Put a link. I'll write that down. Put a link in there for people yeah, yeah, to use yeah. that. But anyway, yep. Yeah, they're pretty good, but they're not, you know, a zone isn't like super hard science. Like a zone is a zone, Yeah. right? Like we're trying to estimate a metabolic response from a certain power output. And even though power is, you know, really as good as it gets in terms of training, it's not exactly perfect, you know, whether we're one watt or above our zone, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah, then we can, not... we've got heart rate then as well, just as a backup. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, but you know, you'll get, you know, your zone one is going to be the lowest level, like just super easy. feels like nothing. Yeah. Zone two is probably your aerobic kind of endurance. And we know like based on all the millions of people that have, you know, been in these studies to kind of develop what these zones are that, um, you know, it's probably something that's an aerobic demand and then they get higher and closer to your threshold. Yeah. So. Okay, cool. So. The other question I'd have was, we've, we've got these zones, right? Um, we also, we got to train in them. Uh, that's sort of a, a topic for, a, you know, a different discussion. But then we've got normalized and average uh, you talked about. So if we want to look at our power, um, we want to, what's what's happening there? Normalized average power, what are the, what are the two? Yeah, so average power is... Here's the work that you did in this time frame, and yep. this is the rate of doing that work in whatever time that was. Yeah, so average okay. is just like the standard average. If you had a, a three, a four, and a three. Um, and a zero. A, you've got a total of 10. Yep. Divide that by three, you, you have, oh, geez, 3.699 recurring. Sure. Standard and if you average. add a zero in there, though. If you add a zero in there, now you've got um, 
10 divided by 4. So you went from 3.699 to 2.5. Yeah. So, so that the, that's the that would be average. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so then how what would normalize do? Yeah, so your average has a tendency to, you know, since it's taken into, into account all the times you coast and you yeah. coast hundreds and hundreds of times when you're, you're going cycling. around a corner, a little downhill, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Even if it's one or two seconds here and there, like you're doing all the time, especially mountain biking where you're coasting like quite a lot even when you're going hard. Yeah. Um so the average power has a tendency to be like a, a kind of low number sometimes based on what you could do. Okay. Um, so this normalized power, it's uh, kind of a more complicated uh, equation. It's taking the cubic root of a whole bunch of things, but it's basically like um, the, the metabolic equivalent of what your power was for this time, right? Okay, okay. So you're going to have to explain that to me a bit more. Yeah, so it's kind of taking into account how long the zeros are. Yeah. So if you have zeros for 10 minutes in a row, yes. um, you had a really, really long time to recover. Yeah, so let's say uh, we took, it was a 20 minute, and I did a 5 minute all out, 10 minute rest, 5 minute all out. That's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah something like that. So, so, so it, it looked at that zero for 10 minutes. Yeah. Or, or the 50 watt or whatever, really low, yeah. low number. Yeah, yep. that's right. So, you know, if you took your, your normalized power in that example, um, you know, it might be closer to average power, right? Then compared to if you did 10 minutes really hard, had a one minute break, and then, you know, did nine minutes really hard because that those zeros were, it was a really small amount of zeros, right? Yep. So your normalized power would be, you know, quite high. Okay, sorry. You sort of lost me there. Go go back over that. Why would it be, why would it be so different? I thought like if I had a five minute effort, yeah. um, let's say three hundred watts, um, fifty watts for ten minutes, and then another three hundred watts. Like now we've got this huge section of time at at, at fifty watts. I thought essentially what um, normalized power would be like if you were going to do this twenty minute effort at a sustained time like this is what you would this is what you'd do if you hadn't like had any rest yeah um, you you wouldn't do 300 watts the whole time you'd do like i don't know 200 probably yeah so i totally explained it wrong just there didn't i <laughs> uh, that's a pretty bad example i guess um, i know what you're trying to say with the metabolic equivalent like if i did um 10 seconds on 50 seconds off, so one minute, and they just keep smashing that, um, the average power is going to be pretty low, isn't it? Because yes. it just takes into account the 50 seconds of zero watts. Whereas um, if I looked at the normalized, the metabolic average or equivalent would be like, actually, if you didn't go so hard and had such poor pacing, if you're looking at it in that way, you would actually be able to average 300 watts across this whole 10 minutes. That's what you'd actually be able to do for because you put out so much energy across this. But instead, because you went hard and easy and hard and easy, um, your average power now looks really low. Right. Yeah, that's a much better way to explain okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually a little bit worried I was getting it wrong. But, no, no, no. Because that's no, how no, I'd right. explain it. I'd be like, you know, if you were to... Um, we just had Ironman New Zealand over the weekend. Actually, shout out to Mike Phillips, my mate who won. Um, congrats Mike but that's a that's a hard surface it's it's quite undulating very um, windy conditions so then what you get in Ironman New Zealand is a huge variations in power you know it's not like a, a flat out and back um, where you can just go oh, I'm gonna lock in 250 watts hoon out there hoon back so your average power is essentially 250 it's like you're at 380 and then you're at 200 and then you're you know into the headwinds you might be hidden uh, higher um so if you were to normalize it it looks a lot nicer you know it might be like a 280 watt normalized but actually your average because you keep having all these zeros it's like um more like a 230 or something yeah right yeah yeah i, th yeah. I think hopefully we're, we're helping people on that one yeah, yeah, yeah. I think your example is kind of way better. Um, you know, to be honest, like when I look at normalized, so what I'll normally look at is like a cross country race or something. 
yeah. I look at normalized power, say every lap or over the whole race. Um, I pretty much will only kind of look at normalized power each lap. So that'll give me a real good snapshot of what, what the, how hard the person was able to go each lap, right? So take into account uphills, downhills, and everything. So that gives me the good snapshot, right? Okay. And this yep. normalized power. Yeah. So then what I'll do is I'll pick, um, I'll look at the elevation graph and I'll look at, you know, a big climb, right? Yep. So each lap, if there were four laps, I'll look at the biggest climb on each lap and see what the average power was each time they did that. Um, okay. so because that's the sustained effort really right yeah, yeah yeah sure and you know if you're really fatigued um that last lap up the biggest climb your average power is going to be just horrendous yeah right so if you kind of blow up or whatever um, yeah and uh, you'll probably notice that in the normalized power as well but you know i like to look at that those little snapshots i like to look at average power yeah so if we've uh, got uh, an event of any type um Generally, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong in this. Uh, yeah, similar to you, I'll look at the whole thing. What's our average? Uh, depending on the event, like if we're looking at for the uh, like individual um, like non-drafting triathletes or a time trial for a cyclist, uh, I'm going to look at it and I want, a, knowing the course, if the course is pretty much flat, I want normalize and average to be quite similar because um, that's going to show me that there's no huge spikes or um, negative sort of uh, pacing strategies or positive pacing strategies, I guess, where, where someone's blowing up. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm looking, at, looking at those, seeing how they compare. Then if there's laps, I'm going to look at uh, normalized across the laps, compare those. And then, yeah, like you said, that, um, specific sections. Like why, you know, why was your... I'll look at peak sort of one minute, peak two, five, and ten, and just you know depending on the duration, go why was your peak five at the very start, um, yep. and and then generally just uh, chop it up really, and and try and look for in time trialing a very nice consistent effort, and then in like cyclists it's more like, well yeah where were you. Here's how much work we essentially figure you can do throughout a three to five hour race. Why were you on the front or trying to chase down uh, breaks? So again, looking at those five, ten minute power efforts. Um, when the when the decisive climb was at the end and you couldn't put out um, this amount. Yeah. Is that? Well, yeah, I mean that's when power you know becomes really good when you're analyzing your race performances. So like. Yep. Um, yeah, you can use it to guide your training, really important. You can use it to, you know, assess your fitness. But, you know, as a coach, like when we have power in a race, um, that that's really a good way to guide those training, like yeah. the whole training program. And, especially, you know, so things like you said, like, you know, if someone blows up early on or they, you know, do some, you know, say they produce their best ever five minute power because they're really fresh, feeling really good, and they do their best ever five-minute power yeah. at the very start of a race. Well, you know how you feel when you do your best ever five-minute power, <laughs> and you're pretty tired afterwards. Yeah. So, you know, someone could, you know, blow up in that first five minutes. They actually had an amazing um, physical performance, but their race result sucked because they just blew up. Yeah. It's also and, good, like, I've had a couple athletes do their, you know, have a, a – fairly average result um but then you look at the numbers and empower you know because if it's a time trial or whatever or a hill climb and they're like oh, you know i was i was whatever result 15th 20th but you're like look you just did your best ever power like this is this is you you can't ask for more than being the best version of yourself on that day 15th is where you were yeah, that's right. Like, cause you know, your results on paper, and it's really tough when you're racing because your result on paper is based on the other people that were there. Right. Yeah. But your results in terms of, you know, how you've improved with yourself, you know, you can just look at your power, yeah. you know, cause you don't know what the other people are doing. They could have had the very best ride of their entire lives. And, you know, suddenly like, you know, you're, you know, 15th, like you said, and, um, and maybe you did or didn't have the best ride of your life. But if you have your power and you know what you can do, it puts it into perspective. 
Yeah. So when we when we look at power, then um, we need to consider weight. Yeah, we do. So um, it you know if I have this cup. If this is full of water, it's going to take more work. Okay, to so lift for it. for those just uh, listening, yes, Matt has a cup. Yeah. Okay, so I have a cup in my hand, and <laughs> yep. if it's full of water and I lift it, I yep. know the distance that I lifted it, right? Yep. So it's going to take more work to lift a heavier cup, right? Sure, I can understand that. Taking a drink. Yep. So if you think of your body as the cup. Yep. Right. So it's going to take more work to go up a hill with a full cup, right? So if you're, uh, you know, big and fat yep. um, and you're going up a hill, um, yep. it's going to, your power, the rate of the work that you do is going to have to be higher um, to go the same speed as someone that's lighter, Yeah. for okay. example. So that's why, you know, when we go, when we talk about power, a lot of times for cyclists, we talk about uh, power to weight, the power to weight ratio. Yeah, so, watts per kg. Yeah, watts per kg. So you'll see that listed in most of the things that you'll read about power, it'll be watts per kg is, you know, kind of the most, the most important um, thing for cyclists. Yeah. Um, you know, because if you're lighter, you're going to go faster at a given power output. Okay. Okay. So then that's also quite important to look at uh, comparing ourselves. Like if I do 300 watts, but then I lose 5 kgs and I do 280 watts, watts per kg wise, I've actually improved. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, you might see that a lot in like your own training. Like you, you might lose a lot of weight and maybe your power didn't change, yep. you know, because, but because you're being more consistent in your training, um, you know, or maybe you changed your diet. Um, like the previous podcast, yeah, low carb, yeah, that's maybe right. tried the low that. carb one where yeah, we talked about significant reducing... finding in that study uh, actually was an increased watts per kg across, across all participants. Yeah. So anyway. Imp- yeah. That's really important yeah. if they're, you're doing an event where it involves going up a hill because you're fighting against gravity. Okay. Um, so when we, if we're going up a hill, Matt, I'm bigger than you. Um, and why, like, why is it, why is it that I'm having to push more power to go at the same speed you are? Because this little thing called gravity, right? Okay. So we're constantly fighting gravity going up a hill. Um, so since you weigh more, even if we're going at the same exact pace or, yeah. or maybe if I'm going, um, that's not a good example, but to go <laughs> the same pace, yeah. you know, just because you have to fight gravity more, yeah. you're just going to have to do more work to do that. Yeah. And that's okay. exactly it. Yeah. 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 Right. All right. So, um, yeah. Watts per kg. The other one, I guess, watts per kg is very important, especially for going up a hill, and it's very, very good to compare. Um, that's more of a apples with apples kind of thing. Um, cyclists get a bit uh, carried away with, oh, he or she did 300 watts for 20 minutes. It's like, yeah, well, he or she weighs 80 kgs and you weigh 50. Like, that's different. But then absolute power is very important for going fast on the flat, right? Yeah, that's right. So, like, when we're going up a hill, the main thing we have to contend with is gravity. Yeah. And when we're going on the flat, the main things we have to contend with are, um, you know, rolling resistance and aerodynamic drag. Yes. Right? So, in that kind of case, um, you know, you would need to be able to produce more power full stop, right? Because, um, you know, the drag difference between someone like you and me yeah. Right. Um, since you're much bigger than me, um, it's 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 not a huge difference in drag. Like there's yeah, a especially difference. if we're both on a time trial bike. Yeah. Like you the know? frontal area. Yeah. Right. Of you and I on a time trial bike, isn't a huge difference. But when we're going up a hill, it is going to be a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So to go to yeah. the same pace up a hill, you'll have to produce more power than me. Yeah. And when we get to the flat. Yeah. I'm gonna have to produce way more power, uh, relatively than you just to keep up with you. So I'm actually, yeah. I'll probably have to go over my limit just because we have pretty much equal amount of drag. Like it's pretty close. Yeah, pretty yeah. Equal. So, you know, for, from we almost, you know, going, going up a hill, we have to essentially produce um, the same watts per kg. 
but I'm going to be producing more power in that because if we have, well, yeah, I have more kgs, so that's more power. Um, but then on the flat, we both have to produce 300 watts to overcome essentially the same rolling resistance and the same drag, but now that's more watts per kg for you than it is for me. So that's the heavier right. you are, and essentially if you're the same aerodynamics, you're going to be able to go, you know, you're going to be able to produce 300 watts or more quite easily, whereas the small person is going to struggle. Um, yeah. And that's why big middle-aged cyclists love smashing the flats. <laughs> oh, and they can they can do it, you know? Yeah. Um, just They can just motor. Like, so the bigger you are, the faster you're going to be on the flat. Yeah, and you um, also have that ongoing potential energy. Yeah, sure. Like, you're going faster, so you're just going to keep going faster. And, yeah. you know, that's one thing that you don't see when you're inside on the trainer because you don't really have that. But, um, yeah, so for me, you know, riding side by side with you on the flat, I, I'm going to blow up sooner. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Um, and then the opposite for, for us on the hill. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and there's another one I found... I'm not sure if this really relates to power. I think it, it, it kind of does. It's quite interesting. I don't know if you've seen it. I was trying to figure out why why some cyclists are really good at time trials and others were good at hill climbs, or you could produce more power going up a, up a hill. And it was around the cadence and application of force. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about that? You know yeah. about that? Yeah, so I think this is like super important, like especially because I work with mountain bikers a lot. Yeah. Mountain bikers can't train on trails all the time because there's too much impact. So they yep. do a lot of their training on the road, right? Sure. So, yep. you know, for a mountain biker, when they're, you know, say doing an XC race or doing like a, a downhill race with some sprints or something, um, their cadence is actually, you know, quite low, right? So the way that they produce... What's, what's their, low? So, you know, a mountain biker grinding up a hill, um, yep. they might be at like 60 or, you know, 65, 70 RPM. Yeah, so that is, quite, that is quite low. Like if That's, you're on the road, you get wait, you're generally above 90. Yeah, so, you know, you're given 300 watts going up that hill um, at, you know, 65 RPM. You know, mountain bikers feel pretty good pushing a really high torque, right? Yep. So to maintain the same power, um, if you change one of the variables, whether cadence or torque, um, let's say you reduce the cadence, to maintain that 300 watts, you're going to have to produce a higher torque. Yeah. Right, so mountain bikers are really good at high torque pedaling. Yeah. Um, essentially, because that's what they do all the time when they're mountain biking. Yeah, yeah. So you get that same person on the road to do 300 watts um, on the flat, you know, going, you know, 30, 40 Ks an hour. Um, they'd probably be going pretty quick. Um, you know, um, they're, they might struggle to maintain that 90, you know, RPMs, the cadence that the road is going to demand. Really. Yeah, yeah, because um, now you have less time to apply force. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, that's why you see um, road riders excelling at road riding and mountain bikers excelling at mountain biking. You know, to be able to change between the sports, um, you need to kind of make sure that you're getting the right adaptations that you need. Yeah. But then hill um, climbing is kind of hill climbing. Um, so yeah. what... What some people, when I was going back to the question I'd been asked about, like, why can I produce more power going up than, like, in a time trial? It's often, if you climb a hill, like Matt said, you're going to be climbing at, like, 60, 70 RPM. Maybe high would be, like, an 80. Um, if you're doing that, obviously you're not pedaling as many times in a minute, RPMs, revolutions per minute. So you have more time per pedal stroke to push down on the pedals. Now, when you're time trialing, say you get up to 40 k's an hour, you might be at 1 to 110. So now you've, you've got 110, you've got like 40, 50 more pedal strokes within that minute. You have a whole lot less time, so you've got to produce a larger force in a shorter amount of time, um, which requires a larger muscle mass, different muscular recruitment, different neural pathways. It's, it's actually quite different to just... I'm riding my bike and this is putting power out. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's pretty big differences there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, riding at a high cadence though is pretty good Yeah. because like, you know, so no, no matter what kind of training that you're doing, um, a high cadence is good because, um, you're getting more Venus return, um, with every pedal stroke that so you make. Blood. So 
Yeah. yeah, so like every contraction that you make with your muscles in your legs, you're pushing more blood back um, into your cardio, like back up to your heart pretty much. Yeah. So you're getting more uh, blood ejected from your heart, um, so more oxygen delivered. So it's, it's quite good to train at a high cadence. Yeah. Right? Um, and that's so even though, you know, mountain bikers need a low cadence for the activities that they do, when yep. they're training, training at a high cadence is still pretty good. And if you mix the two within your training program, there's nothing to really worry about. Um, so, question around you obviously understand Ironman, Iron, and you got, or even half Ironman, where you're going 90Ks to 180Ks, anywhere from sort of the absolute best at two hours, um, all the way up to, yeah, like eight hours, nine hours on the bike. Now, some people in this in these situations are going to be running at, at a low cadence due to the relative power outputs and intensities they're exercising at for, you know, for most people, three hours plus. Um, and so there's actually less strain, cardiovascular strain. Um, and that has been found to, in some cases, some people induce like a relate to a better running response uh, because there's less muscular contractions across the bike leg and overall it's less demanding. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, running's pretty hard. Yeah, you running's know, and, damn hard. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're doing that as the last event after a really long time um, on the bike, um, yeah, I guess it would be about minimizing what your losses are on the bike while still going pretty quick. Yeah, so the theory around it was like there's less muscular contractions, so less potential for fatigue and cramp, um, and then less cardiovascular strain because you're not working at such a high intensity that you're going to blow up or that you need to clear lactic or, or bicarbonate, um, hydrogen ions, um, or even transport a lot of glucose or anything. So that the actual venous return heart pumping thing is not like a huge worry. Um, this is a theory anyway. I'm not sure if it, I mean, most most uh, of the best guys are, are still hidden 90 to 100. Um, but some of the females are, 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 um, have been known to ride mm. at 60 to 70. So I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. And it makes sense as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of does when I think of power though, I think, you know, um, you know, if you're doing work for eight hours, you know, um, you'll eventually get a pretty similar cardiovascular response. I, I just don't know enough about that, but you know, yeah. the bike, as far as I know in triathlon, the bike isn't where it's really, uh, one, isn't it? Like you, you stand to lose more in the run than you can make up in the bike is that kind of the yeah case? yeah uh i mean if we really if we really get into it, it it does get more complex depending on terrain and temperatures like in kona uh because of the heat aspect of it you have more convective cooling on the bike so you can afford to uh go a bit harder um because you can dissipate heat a lot easier yeah. um especially if you are if you've got a good cyclist, you need to play to your strength in that kind of condition. Because once you get onto the run, if you're a good cyclist, you're generally a bigger person. And once you get onto the run, there's everyone's equal um, in terms of being able to dissipate heat. As I said, like we discussed, if you're a really big guy or girl on the bike um, and it's really hot, you can produce a lot more watts and we can cool ourselves so I can you know, go a lot faster than a smaller person. When you get onto the run, the bigger person is suffering uh for sure so it's a it's a, a balancing act there in terms of like how much time can you gain on someone and then force them to run up to you yeah but but you still got to run yeah you know and yeah. um long distance triathlon you got to run a half marathon to a marathon so if you can't do that effectively then then yeah it doesn't really matter what you did on the bike yeah, it doesn't matter what you're uh, Iron Man New Zealand just over the weekend was a prime example. So the guy, uh, Andrew Starkowitz, I'm, uh, I have to double check if he set the bike course record. I think it, it would have been very close. And he had 19, 17, 19 minutes on Mike Phillips, the eventual winner, who caught him with two Ks to go. 
with a, an absolute blistering 240 run. So there you go, you know. Like Andrew Starkowitz is the is the uber biker um, and, and he played to his strengths and it just didn't work out on that on that day um wow but, uh, so the, there you go that would have been a race to watch then yeah <laughs> yeah it was good yeah. it was really good yeah. yeah um so i i guess yeah we've we've covered everything right the that i mean we're not going to do the how to train for, no. for cycling but we've, how to test your power how to retest your power where to test it how to analyze your rides, um, normalize power. There's also a couple other things if you really get into it, into like training peaks or something. Variability index, which is essentially just how variable you were across a ride. Um, you know, in a flat time trial, you want to be pretty consistent. 300 watts all the way throughout. If you went 380 to 210 to 400, then your variability index is going to be variable. So it's going to be higher. Um, and then there's like power to heart rate decoupling, um, or ratio. So yeah. if you're able to sustain a power and your heart rate went really high, or if you're able to, in an aerobic ride, I do have a little look at that to see if, um, if heart rate and power just remained the same steady state. Um, cause if there's a huge discrepancy there, then, uh, the athletes might've been going too hard at, at certain times. Yeah. Right. Um, or conditions like heat and stuff. Otherwise, Matt, anything from you? Yeah, I think like pacing is pretty important. And we talked about that before. And we were actually going to talk about that today <laughs> before we changed gears. But, you know, I think, you know, now that we kind of have this basis of power, I think, you know, we can have better pacing conversation. So Yeah, um, yeah, we can reference important. people back to this. Uh, yeah, well, now that we've got, once we've tested our power, we can look at those numbers and go, look, I'm at, I'm at, whatever 20 watts above what my threshold is i know i can't sustain this like yeah. this is the team sky or tom dumoulin approach of like i'm gonna climb a hill at this and this is essentially the physiological ceiling of humans so have at it yeah um, yeah yeah pacing's pretty good and that, like we can have a whole conversation on that um, well we did um yeah not on the podcast uh pre-podcast there's a video out there yeah on but on we'll the do Facebook it again page. yeah we'll yeah we'll again. definitely do yeah. it again um and yeah if you want to have any of your questions answered via the the podcast just write in to to us comment on the facebook page message whatever there's like a thousand maybe you just comment on one of matt strava rides it's it's all out there <laughs> yeah yeah there there if there's a will there's a way that's me yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right then uh matt before i head off anything on for the week weekend yeah uh heading down south tonight um nz enduro three-day cool. enduro race so um kind of an adventure kind of thing do a bit of camping and yeah should be pretty fun how about you uh cambridge 10k running mm -hmm. race so that's going to be the first real test in the lead up to uh the rotorua marathon um so that's my big Big target, hoping to get a new personal best there, a local local marathon, and yeah, that's Sweet. that's pretty much it, really. Should be good. Yeah, mate. Uh, all right then. Catch you later, everybody. Bye bye. <laughs>